that line in the song, uh, that phrase, Jesus alive in me, really struck me. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit, hopefully, today. Uh, but I want you to think about that. Um, on the one hand, that could be like a really abstract thought, like how does that work? I mean, he's alive in me? I, that's kind of weird. Like, where is he? Like, um, but you know, he said that he would send his spirit, and by his spirit being in us, that he and the Father would take their abode in us. And that is mind-blowing, but it's true, nonetheless. And, and in, in a sense, it's a challenge for us to enter into that extraordinary reality of what he has said. He said, this is what's happening. Whether you like it or not, that's what's happening, okay? Um, and that's, I'm there. So the teaching today, our extraordinary, ordinary life, counts on that. Um, but, you know, all of us were brought up to think about um, extraordinary events, extraordinary people in the context of history. And we think in terms of wars, we think in terms of, you know, nations, famous leaders, good and bad. Huge events that have caused shifts almost in the way people live, uh, changes in the world. My lifetime, you know, the Vietnam War, Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon, uh, the internet, September 11th, and most recently, you know, the pandemic. Uh, these are huge events in the world, and they're examples of what we call kind of history making. And they will be seen as that for generations to come until, of course, an event occurs that's going to re reshape everybody's thought about history, which is when Christ returns. And it will become abundantly clear to everybody alive at that time that history is and has always been about God and his working of salvation within humankind and the earth he created. That's what history is about. And you're not going to be taught this in school. Society isn't going to factor God in to history books or the news reports. He's not brought up in the context of huge events to give a why behind them. But that doesn't matter because he is most assuredly there. And we don't need to fit God into history. We don't because it's already his story. But in America, we're really good at that, by the way. We've all been, up, been brought up in this exercise of fitting God into our history. And it's, so, it's something that we have to be aware of, that when we're really looking over the span of time, past, present, future, that it isn't defined by what we say happened and we fit God into it. It is absolutely defined that it's really just God's purposes and plans, and we happen to be falling into his narrative, not the opposite. Salvation is the heartbeat of history since Genesis 1-1. It is the game that brings everything that happens, including everything that happens to each of us, onto the playing field of history. And it's a game in which there are no spectators. We are all in it. The meaning and outcome of our lives is truly at stake, and the results are eternal. Now, historians will assemble achievements of nations and civilizations to try to establish the meaning and the nature of their influence on human affairs, and then they'll call it historic, right? So kings and generals are prominent, buildings, monuments, they become really important artifacts. Literature is carefully studied and try to be understood in the context of today's understanding. Trade routes with their economic implications are traced. Battles, treaties, pestilence, famines, plagues, all of them leave their mark on history. And one prominent example of this that we are all aware of uh, is Egypt. To this day, the monuments, and if I, has anybody been to Egypt? I mean, I have had the privilege of being there, but if you go there to this very day, if you're standing there at the, at the pyramids or the Sphinx or the Karnak Temple, uh, and it's, which is in the city of Luxor on the Nile River, it's, it's a, I mean, it blows you away. And when you think about it, these were done thousands and thousands of years ago. Just their enormity and how amazing they are in terms of their art, uh, it's, it's crazy. And it speaks to a kingdom that to this day is really unlike any other we've ever seen. It was an amazing time in human history. You know, and it still, I mean, like, it still staggers your imagination when you, when you happen to see it. And it, it has been a subject of study since, really, I think Alexander the Great went there and tried to take over the country, and uh, he didn't succeed, 
But in the process, he brought back from Egypt all sorts of artifacts which got the whole world excited. Hieroglyphics, you know, stumped everybody for a while, and then somebody finally figured that out, and then they all got excited about it. And so Egypt became this great uh, focus of study and scrutiny. Well, you know, God has his comments about that time. It's in Exodus chapter 1, and in verse 15, it says, Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puah, When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, she can live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? And let the male children live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, well, it's because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and they give birth before we can get there, you know. <laughs> so God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. You kind of have to stop and really think about this. This is one of those records in the Bible that you're like, how, how did Shifra and Pua survive being called on the carpet by Pharaoh for not doing what Pharaoh commanded them to do? How is it that they walked out of his temple or his, you know, his castle or wherever, you know, his, how did they get out of his office alive? <laughs> Because you don't do that, right? I mean, the Pharaoh says, here's what you need to do, and then you, you just don't do it. He calls you in, and then he kills you. Not only did they walk, God had favor on them, and they had families, and the you know, Hebrews grew strong and numerous, and that was the outcome. And it changed history, absolutely changed history, because they started a, a whole movement in midwives. And male ch children from the Hebrews were being born and, and saved by these midwives all over the place. Um, one of which was a guy named Moses, okay? And so there is a little bit of a story then that, that ensues from that, right? So our whole story of salvation can be traceable back to two women, Shifra and Pua. What's interesting, too, about the record is you see that biblical writers don't have a lot of interest in spectacular achievements of men and women. They're not interested in arrogant displays of ego, what they're interested in is God, and they know better than to look for God in signs of ego-satisfying achievements, prideful temples, etc. What's really interesting is that um, the first names that appear in this foundational record of God's salvation at work in history are Shifra and Pua. Two simple midwives from the lowest social and economic strata of that history-making Egyptian society, right? And these two women defy the order of the king. And by that, by that act of defiance, they set in motion a chain of historical events that becomes a turning point in history, his story, in God's narrative, his story, which we have today. We can read it. The king of Egypt, who's also referred to as the pharaoh, the most powerful ruler at that time in the world, and perhaps ever. I don't know if anybody has wielded the kind of power and authority that pharaoh yield or wielded at that time. He's not even dignified with a name. God doesn't give him a name. He's just, he's just a pharaoh. He's just a king. Shifra and Pua, now they I will name for all history and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times their names have been etched on parchment, on pages, for thousands of years. Just two ordinary Hebrew women. And by virtue of that, they are not common. They are named. They're extraordinary. You know, as midwives, their job was to bring babies into the world. And when the most powerful king orders them to kill these same babies, they simply, and without big fanfare, defy him. No, we're not doing it. So you have this invincible king versus these very vulnerable women. And one of the things you're going to see if you think about history 
is that history as told from the point of invincibility is almost always about death. History told from the standpoint of vulnerable believers, it's always about life. So let's not miss that point. Salvation is not something that's just steamrolled and imposed from above or from without. It emerges out of the very conditions in which ordinary people live as they are confronted by that choice between life and death. That is how salvation plays out. And that's still true today. <clears throat> World leaders are minor players in history when viewed and recorded in the biblical way of writing and in the biblical description of participating in history. But Sh Shifra and Pua, and put your names in there, these ordinary people play decisive roles. And until we really understand this, and I want you to think about this, if we don't understand this and embrace it, that this, this placing of the action of salvation is grounded in the personal and the very ordinary human lives, we are not going to participate wholeheartedly in the action of salvation because we won't see ourselves as players. We won't see ourselves as meriting having our names named in his story because, well, we're just ordinary common people. I live a very boring, ordinary life. You should see my life. It's like people talk, oh, don't, you know, don't let, don't have Google Home because it's going to record everything going on and stuff. Go for it. <laughs> and I really feel sorry for the guy who has to sit and listen and transcribe all the things heard because it is going to be really boring. There's not much going on there. So we have to understand this, that we are absolutely essential participants in this, and we are, we are just ordinary people, absolutely, until Christ and, and the Father take their abode in you. And out of your ordinary and common life emerges this extraordinary participation in the story of salvation, which is an eternal story. 1 Corinthians 1 26, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. And I used to read this, you know, think, well, what, what are we, chop liver? I mean, like, seriously? But it's, it's really what he's, he's juxtaposing how the world thinks of greatness and what you have to do to achieve that greatness. And what you have to do is you have to be some sort of great leader in a great government with a lot of power that you wield, and it's normally going to yield death. But we're not like that. There's not, and there's, there's a few who are called out of that, but most of us, we're not like that. But if we continue to think that we have to somehow become noble, become powerful, become influential, in order for us to participate in the greatest story of all, we're not going to grab onto and embrace who we really are. So how does this work? How do we take ordinary, common, unremarkable lives and become lives that God names in the story he's unfolding? And I want, this is, I'm going to use a comparison with something in Scripture. This is not to say this is what Jesus meant when he initiated, okay? I'm just, I'm throwing it out to you guys and for you listening online as a consideration of a metaphor to explain how is it that we can become extraordinary people even in our ordinary and very common lives. And the event I want to go to is in Mark 14, verse 22. <clears throat> and as they were eating, Jesus took some bread, he blessed it, then he broke it in pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, take it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. Now we read about this Last Supper and we see it through the lens of Christian doctrine and tradition and we endow it with this kind of exalted status and meaning a magnificence born out of 2,000 years of Christians reenacting this event, many times, you know, with great fanfare and mystery and bells and smoke, but always with this sense of a, it's a sacred communion, it's a sacred moment, it's a sacrament to us. And so it's through that lens that we look at this record and go, yeah, I mean, that's, wow, this is what was going on. 
But, you know, if you were one of the 12, it was nothing more or less than gathering around food like you'd done hundreds of times. That's what it was. It was a very common, ordinary thing, and bread and wine were very common and ordinary elements. Now, is it tr transcendent to us today? Yes. But not because of the elements themselves. It's because what Christ did with them that makes it transcendent. And if, if you try to make the elements more than they are, you lose the whole message of this. You know, Jesus knew that this uh, meal was going to be singular because he knew this was his last night with him. And he knew that he was going to be captured and su is going to suffer and die. And it's interesting to me that he, you know, what is he going to do? What is he purpose to do with this last evening? You know, and he, it, what he doesn't do is he doesn't lecture them with a new theory of atonement. He doesn't come up and cite a new creed that he wants them to memorize. You know, he doesn't give them a new theology or an explanation about how his suffering and death is going to, you know, change the world. What does he do? He gives them a meal. Just a meal, a common, ordinary meal. And then he asked them to remember it. He took the most common elements of their lives and he transformed them into something transcendent. And in the process, he gives us this metaphor of how our common lives become transformed, unforgettable, and decidedly uncommon in God's sight. And the shape of this is seen in the four words that Mark uses to describe Jesus' actions. Take, bless, break, and give. And it's interesting, these four words, if you look at the feeding of the 5,000, that record, if you look at the feeding of the 4,000, if you look at the meal that he had with uh, Cleopas and the other guy on the road, to, after they were on the road to Emmaus and they had supper that night, those four words show up. Take, bless, break, and give. I think that's amazing, right? I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I think there is a pattern in this that we can learn something from. So when he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he distributed it, that common and mundane element became extraordinary. And so for us, when our common and mundane and ordinary lives are taken by Christ, blessed, broken into multiple morsels and distributed, we become uncommon and extraordinary. But the key thing here to remember is who is doing the taking and blessing and breaking and distributing? Who's doing that? Jesus. He's doing the work. So when Jesus told these same disciples a, a few hours later that he was going to the Father and that he would send the Spirit that would guide them and take of his and give it to them, he was revealing, which they didn't fully understand, I'm sure, at the time, but he was revealing to his followers how he would continue to have impact in their lives, how their lives would be affected by their beloved teacher and Lord for the days to come. And it's still true of us today. So how does this work in your life? How can we become extraordinary people by simply being ordinary and common folks? It's through the Spirit. It's the transformative work of Christ through the Spirit, which is it's revolutionary. In Romans 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may test and approve what is the will of God what is good and well-pleasing and perfect. So in these verses, you know, this is a pretty amazing section of the book of Romans, which itself is pretty amazing. This is, this is Paul really getting into kind of the practical application of how does this work? And he says, he starts in Romans 12 on with, present yourself, which is to say just offer yourself. Offer your life. Well, what... What do we have to offer to him as living sacrifices? Just our, ordi our ordinary lives. That's it. Well, I mean, what else you got? 
for most of us. I mean, we, we don't have kingdoms to offer. Uh, we, we don't have a whole, you know, magnificent kind of world acclaimed territories to offer. We're just normal people going about our normal lives, not so dissimilar from anybody else. I mean, we get up and we go to work and we take care of kids and we eat and we do the stuff we do. But that's what we have to offer him. Our material possessions, our children, our jobs, our daily routines, our meager abilities of brain and body, our past regrets, our present problems, our future hopes, our dreams, our beliefs. I mean, this is, this is who we are. We just come vulnerable before the Lord and say, this is what, this is what I got, and this is all I got. And what does he do with that? He blesses it. He takes what we offer him, and he blesses it all. So our lack of blessing in our lives is not due to anything on Christ's part. He is there at work. He has taken his abode. He knows that it is through common, ordinary lives that he is doing God's salvation mission. And that's his job, by the way. That is what he was called to do. That's what he was raised and exalted to do and given authority over heaven and earth. To do what? To develop and to create a people that would become for God his portion and his inheritance. And he is doing that. That's his job, and he's not stopping. Whether you participate or not, he is at work. So, to, Which is why, through the Spirit in you, he is always waiting for the offering. Always waiting for, here, Lord, take it. And this is why we, we must embrace this role of ours in history. I mean, this is so important. This is the, this is the story that God has been telling and will continually twel, tell and will go for all eternity. It is the story of him saving people and the earth. And our participation that is grounded in our very personal and our very ordinary lives. You know, there is no real division between the sacred and the secular for us. Um, it, just like he could take the bread and the wine, very common, everyday elements, and bless those, he can do that with us. He has that power to bless the most mundane and common elements of our lives. The real division is not between secular and sacred, it's between what have we offered and what have we held back. That's it. But when we offer it, he takes it as, as it is offered. And so we're free to come with, with all of our warts and all of our failings and frailties and simply say, here am I. This is, this is what I have to offer. But remember in Romans chapter 12, in the, in the context it said, do not be conformed to this world. Here's one of the great inhibitors of us bringing ourselves fully and peacefully and joyfully and openly to the Lord. What we, what we do not do is we do not stop being conformed. Now, you'll think of that, many of us will think of that and go right to, well, wait a minute, I'm not, you know, drugs, sex, rock and roll, I cast all that stuff out, I'm not into politics, I'm not into all that worldly stuff, I don't watch a lot of TV, I don't, I mean, I really am not conformed to the world, I am kind of different than the rest of the everyday world out there, and, you know, so I'm not conformed. But, I got to tell you something, I had an interesting opportunity to see this in living color recently in, in some marital counseling I was doing, and both, both the husband and wife invoked their upbringing multiple times and used it as a reason for why they are the way they are, and I can't really be anything else because this is where I came from. It's my genetics, it's my upbringing, I'm a product of that. I can't do anything about that, so the problem my spouse has is learning to deal with just take me as I am. And you know, like some of that, oh, you know, that's fine. Love is, is <laughs> taking people right where they are. But think of that excuse that I am a, I was molded. So I'm basically like a piece of plastic that was from a mold from my parents' upbringing, and I was poured into that mold, and I popped out. And as an adult, that's, that's what I got. That's being conformed to this world. 
no matter what you're doing with your lifestyle, if you still see yourself through the lens of your human upbringing and you know all that stuff. Some of us had a decent upbringing. I'm not saying you, you know, you're rejected. I'm just simply saying, do we see ourselves through the lens that God sees us? Yes, common and ordinary, for sure. And that's who he has called. But what he also sees is that we were, we were designed by him to be his image bearers. And when we got born again, we were given a new parentage, right? We are new creations, not because we're anything more than our ordinary selves. It's because of what he did. He did the work. And we don't want to stop that. We want him to continue to do the work, right? And so when we come to Christ, we, we come without that confirmation to the world. We, we want to cast that off. We bring our minds into that newness of who we really are in him and because of him. And then we offer ourselves to Christ. And he blesses you. And with his hands, he opens you up so that he can then offer your life, your lives to others. And in his hands, our common and mundane and ordinary lives become nothing less than extraordinary. And we become na named people in God's story. Okay? That's what I wanted to share today. God bless you guys. <laughs>